Let us pray. Our Lord and our Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for being here with us in this building. You are always present through your spirit wherever we are, but you meant for us and you mean for us to gather in a space like this, ordained by you yourself, reminded by Paul for us in the book of Romans, that we need to come together to listen to the word of God. We know, O oh Lord, that this is the way that you would like to do your work in us. This is the way, O oh Lord, that you would like to instill in us your wisdom. This is the way that you guide us through a life that's extremely complicated and difficult. We ask, O oh Lord, that today also you will come and you will use the words that I need to share, the words from Scripture, to remind us, O oh Lord, of what it is that you ask of us in the year 2022. Here we sit, and all of us have our own story. All of us are struggling with something in our lives. All of us are trying to figure out life in our own way. I come and I pray and I ask that through your Spirit, that today, O oh Lord, you will use your word to bring to each one of us what you know we may need to be able to live to our fullest and to your glory. In your name we ask this. Amen. We all have one. And most of us have no idea how important it is and how much of an impact it has on our lives. Most of us have one that's sort of similar, but there are definitely deep differences between what you and I may have. And what I'm talking about that we all have that is so extremely important is your worldview. I need to, get, ah, there it goes, our worldview. So, so this person gave us this definition. He says, a worldview is a way of thinking and living that pursues a way of life intended to achieve or maintain wellness in as many domains as possible, physical, professional, social, and religious. And then because culture is so closely related to a worldview, there's this definition of culture. The ideas and physical objects or things that represent a group or society. A worldview. In short, I would say a worldview is just the way that you and I think and we look at life and how we respond to it. I've been on our HOA in our neighborhood for many years, and the president for a long time, not this year, probably for 18 years or so. You will have no idea the kind of requests that we got from people when they'd want to paint their house. We would sit there and look, how is it possible that you want to paint your house this color with a bright green door? It's not going to work in no way, shape, or form in our neighborhood. What are these guys thinking of asking even of us to approve this kind of thing? Worldview. So a few weeks ago, I'm sitting with George in Pokora. That's now this very small town in Nepal. Our flight is somewhat delayed. I get bored really easily. So I look around and walk around, and then I sit. And there's a couple sitting next to me, and I said, I want to ask you guys a rhetorical question. With a smile, I said, why would people advertise cement in an in a, in a airport. So on every pillar, there is an ad advertisement of cement. I I'm going to pick up a bag of cement just before I fly out. That's what I sort of thought to my, I thought it's funny. What you advertise in an airport is normally stuff like the odorants, you know, and, and what, you know that kind of stuff. So I just said, why cement? The guy sitting to my right, I didn't even look at him. He said, well, every country has its own peculiar, peculiarities, or that word, uh, your country probably also. I said, what country are you referring to, sir? He said, well, yours. I said, I'm just think it's funny. 
He said, well, businessmen fly through this airport. I looked around, only tracking people, people that try to climb up mountains. Right? I do not know if you want to take a bag of cement up a mountain, but it's, 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 a, it's your choice if you want to. I said to you, where are you from? From France or Switzerland? Because he had a really deep French accent. He didn't respond. My worldview. When I heard his comment, when I listened to his, to, his, to, his, to his accent, I immediately assumed he's from France or from Switzerland because they are a little bit like that. Um, oh, you understand what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so a worldview actually gives us our political view. How many times I've heard people say to me, how can you vote for this or that party? What's wrong with their minds? It has to do with a worldview. The worldview is the thing that actually causes racism because we look at different people in different ways and it comes from the way that we look at life. So how did you and I sitting in this church get our worldview? And I'm going to use an illustration. In a way, when you and I were, are born, we are a little bit like this balloon. And I'm going to give you this slide. This is when you and I are born. We've got our shape. Now, this one is round. I just, <laughs> you understand. So, so we are born with, with our genetics inside us and, and a number of things. But then what happens is I start to blow air into this balloon. Now I have done my little bit. Now I give it to Rachel. And I say, you also. Give it to Miguel. I say, you also. To Doctor, you also. And to, I pass this balloon on in the church. And then when I'm done... Ooh. I picked up this balloon this morning outside the fellowship hall. So I do not know who knew I was going to preach about balloons, but it was outside. In this balloon is somebody's breath. So if 10 people would blow up this balloon, inflate this thing, or this one, and I would tie it like this, and I would keep this balloon for a year, let's say, for an example, if I would release the air out of this balloon a year after we inflated it, the breath of those people are still stuck in here. That's how, how you and I get our worldview. You see, you and I are a little bit like this balloon, and, and, and somebody started to breathe into me my, in my life. And the first people that breathed into me, uh, my understanding of life, is, were my parents. My dad was not a fisherman. He thought it somewhat boring. He was as restless as I am. And maybe I'm as restless as he is. So my dad never took me fishing. I never caught a fish in my life, I think. I can't remember I bought a fish, caught a fish in my life. So when I look at people going out in the ocean to go fishing, I say to myself, what are you guys going to do there? Because I didn't grow up fishing. I did not understand fishing. I do not know fishing. Worldview. Your dad, your mom took you out fishing. You know how to fish. Part of your worldview. Then I was exposed to other adults. Now think for a moment in your life of a comment that somebody made when you were younger, an adult in your life. I can specifically remember certain things that people said to me that really played a huge role in me and in my, in my life as I start to think about life. People that I looked up to, that I saw, thought were some authority, and I still remember what they told me. Same with siblings, with friends, the media. There's no escape that you and I sitting in this building are hugely impacted in our worldview about uh, uh, through the media. The media constantly tells us how I should think, how I should respond, what I should think about this, how I should respond. Oh, you're not supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. You're not supposed to think like this. You're supposed to think like that. Of course, my worldview is impacted by my geography. I'm an African. I was born in Africa. I can speak Zulu. I'm a fifth generation African. I grew up with the sun sitting in Africa and listening to the kind of animals that people pay thousands of dollars to go and see, and, and that sort of was in our backyard. We didn't have a hippo in our pool. We didn't have a pool. But, but um, a lot of people have asked me, so are the hippos in your pool? No, no, they are not in our pool. <laughs> but, but our geography also, in a sense, has a role in how I look at life. And then culture. That definition that we had there for a moment. 
So every single one of us sitting in this church have been inflated by all of those things, and the breath of all of those things and those people are inside us. And in a way, it is forming in us our principles, our values, our morals. If you grew up in a house where your parents were cussing nonstop, you would be a cussing adult and not feel guilty about saying all these big words. Because that's what you got used to. If you grew up in a house where your parents didn't care really for furniture or taking care of their stuff, then you would be a person that would go through life and not really care for anything of anyone. How many times do you, uh, do you and I watch TV and say, how could someone do this or think this or whatever? Where did that view come from that I am allowed to do this? How many times it comes from all of these things that we just referred to now that inflate it into you and me or to that person then what he or she thinks. What are these values and moral codes and things that I'm talking about? These are our truths. You see, I took a picture there, or I have a picture there of a, a, a person that's teaching a class. You go to university, your, your professor that stands in front of you actually starts to teach a class, and while you or she is teaching, they are actually also instilling in you what their beliefs are about life and about living. That doesn't stop. I can remember certain things that professors of mine said when I studied psychology especially. And later on, as I grew older and more mature, I realized these guys were actually telling us what they think how you should respond to certain things that had nothing to do with the academic work that we did, but that was completely personal. And as a student, I believed them. And certain things they said were really harmful to choices that some students made or could make. So that's my truth. So I base my life on the truths that I have in my life. So I make certain decisions on a truth that I believe is true for me. I make certain choices because it's based on truth and things that I believe, and it's part of my worldview. This is how I think my world should operate, the world should operate, and I am standing by this. That is my truth. That's maybe why the world and the world we now live in say that you can have your own personal truth, and in a way that's true. That has nothing to do with lying. That has to do with my understanding of how things should be because this is my truth. Today I'm going to continue with my series and eventually we are getting to Scripture. Uh, where the Lord said to His disciples, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm going to look at the truth section now that, that uh, is now the next in line. In the Gospel of John, John actually uses the word truth 46 times. He uses the word truth more than all the other Gospels do it combined. Matthew, Mark, or Luke combined don't use the word as much as John uses it in his, only, in, in his, in his Gospel. Fifteen out of the 21 chapters of the Gospel of John has the word truth in it. So it seems to me that to John this was an extremely important lesson or word or value that John wanted to teach his readers about what Jesus said about truth. So what did the Lord say about truth? Now, what, one of the great examples is when the Lord was standing in front of Pilate. You'll find this in the Gospel of John. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to, G to the Jews again and told them, I can't find, find no case, case against him. John 17, do not belong to the world just as I told you not to belong to the world. S sanctify them in the truth. This is a prayer. Go and read this. It's your homework. Go on. In John 17, the Lord is praying for His disciples. He's praying for us because we are the followers of Jesus. And this is part of His prayer for us. The Lord praying for His followers, the following. They, us, do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. 
Your word is truth as you have sent me into the world. So I've sent him into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so they also may be sanctified in the truth. Again, last one. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had, been, who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Countless of university campuses have these words inscribed somewhere. Uh, if, you continue, uh, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. But the question is, what truth are we talking about? That's the issue. The one and only truth. So Pilate stands before the Lord and he says to him, are you a king? Then the Lord answers him. You see, in Pilate's, Pilate's world view, there's only but one king, and that's the king in, Jeru uh, in, in, in Rome. The emperor. He's the king. In his worldview, there is no way that there can be another king except the one that's there. Now the Lord stands in front of him and he's got a completely different truth. He's got a completely different understanding of life. You and I live in a world where people don't see God. They don't care for God. They don't even think about the kingdom of God. So when you and I start to talk about God and his kingdom, they look at us as we are crazy like Pilate did. He said, so this king, you're a king. The Lord says, I am. That's the truth. And Pilate said, what's the truth? But the Lord said, I'm the, I am the king in God's truth. And God's truth is that God said, I'm the one who created the heaven and the world and the earth. I'm the only one that's the king. And Jesus Christ is my son and he's also then king. But here is immediately a clash between the culture of that time, the world of that time, the people of that time, in seeing what God wants us to see and that we can't see. And that is the presence of God Almighty then in this world. The only truth is to have a godly response then to what we know about who God is. So you and I respond constantly then to what people have taught me. But now it seems to me if I say I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, I need to for a moment think about my worldview. My world worldview is who I am in a sense. It's my humor is part of my worldview. I look at the world and I think everything is funny. But that's part of my worldview. But I sometimes need to look at my worldview and ask myself the question, but is my worldview in line then with God's worldview? And the way that I respond to this world, is that in line with the culture of this world or then with what God asks of me to do? And at the end of the day, it has to do with the person of God, isn't it? You see, we allow a number of people in our lives to play a role in who we are, and they teach us what we need to think and what we need to believe and how we need to respond. But where does the person of God fit into all of this? And that's why it's so important for you and me, if we want to survive in this world with a different kind of worldview, is to allow God to be a part of my life on a daily basis. I can't just think about God for an hour on a Sunday. That may be not enough. So how does God, and I'm almost done, how does God help me to understand and maybe then even correct my worldview? He does it through his word. The Bible is alive. That's what Luther said. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Luther was really excited about the Bible. He said, you can't get away from the Bible because it's the word of God that will chase you. Because God will not keep silent about who he is and what he asks of us. That's why Jesus is called the word of God, because how otherwise can God instill in us who he is and what he asks of us if we, if we do not listen? Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. The truth will make you free. You see, uh, at universities they use the last part of the sentence, but they leave many times the first one, the first part out. And the first part says, if you continue in my word, in my word. So the Bible is the authority on salvation. We know this, and faith. And sadly, that's what many times people only think the Bible is. The Bible, the Bible helps you to know God. The Bible helps you to have faith. But the Bible is way more this, than this. The Bible is the only authority on life and living. Um, just if you 
are done reading John 17 as your homework, you need to read the book of Proverbs. That's the part of your homework also. The book of, Pro book of Proverbs um, talks about life a lot. It talks about how to think about life in many different ways and, and, and to form a godly worldview because that's what the book of Proverbs is, all, Proverbs is all about. Solomon wrote most of those things from a perspective that we need to have a godly worldview. And the godly worldview will help us to respond then to the world in a godly manner. Otherwise, I'm going to respond to this world in a cultural manner or in my own worldview manner that may not be godly. And many times, our responses will be contra-culture. Many times. You see, the culture is also always trying to tell me that my worldview should be in line with them. But I promise you, our culture is defi definitely not godly or biblical in no way, shape, or form. So I have a battle in me that you may also have. The battle in me is that when I wake up in the morning, my default mode is who I am. And who am I? I'm 30. I was raised by two people in, in South Africa and, and with a sister in a small mining town. And, and I, I, I was breathed into by a lot of people that thought they had all the truth. And they said, this is how you should look at life. And this is what you should think. And this is how you should look at people. And, and I believed those things. Because I'm a little kid. And I believed what these older folks told me. Because I was raised with discipline and to agree with the authority of people and adults. And as I grew older, I discovered at some point, especially living in South Africa, that some of the things that I heard and that I was told to believe are not biblical. But now I need to fight, in a sense, what I think it should be on how it should be biblically. So all of us, in a sense, will have this battle within us to constantly check who I am with what God is telling me who I should be. The fact that I am who I am doesn't mean it's fine. And that's the problem. I say, I'm cool. I'm good. I was raised by a Christian family. But my worldview in many ways got skewed because of all the outside influences that played a role also in my life. So there was a journey for me also to discover certain things that I said, I can't think like this about this anymore because that's not biblical. But my default mode, my normal wake-up mode is there because I've been breathed in by so many others. So sanctified and sharing the truth means to actually read and accept God's truth. But to to know God's truth, I need to read it. I need to know it. And therefore, I try to, to read my Bible a lot. I constantly read through my Bible. I'm starting now in the book of Revelation. I think I started earlier this year in the beginning. I don't know. I can't remember. But I read two or three different places in the Bible. I'm now in Revelation and somewhere else in the Psalms. But I constantly are looking for what God wants to tell me for 2022. When I turn on the news, and when I need to make a decision about political issues and ethical issues, what is it that God wants me to believe in, not Ferdy? Allow the Holy Spirit to guide me and to apply and to practice His will and everything. And to share it. You know, Ruth, if you read the story of Ruth, that whole worldview was changed by the fact that she said, I believe in a God that will take care of us. Jesus came and how did He share His worldview, His God kingdom view by telling people, this is what the kingdom of God is all about. It all came through relationships. And then prayer. The amount of transforming good you can do through prayer is incalculable. Do not neglect this great work God has put in your hands to pray. Let's work to change people's minds with truth and people's wills with prayer. Rick. John Piper, author, theologian. Lord, help me today that my worldview will be your worldview. Lord, help me as I respond to people and to this world. I will not respond in the way that the world responds, but in the way that you as God wants me to respond. Do you know what the sad and the bad news about it is? is that I will many times lose.
because of God's response. You see the French guy next to me, my, my mining attitude was to punch him on the nose. <laughs> Not really. But I grew up in a mining town where they would teach you, if a guy talks to you like this, you punch him on the nose. Do you know what I said? I said to him, Sir, I just think it's funny. I'm not criticizing in my country, any country. I just think cement in an in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, airport is funny. I really think it's really funny. My natural instinct is, you, you know, I don't want to say those words. I'm a pastor. Um, <laughs> but you see, many times you and I will lose a bit of ourselves because you need to apologize. And, and so I'm sorry way more than the world will ever say. Because I need to respond in a way that not my heart or my mind tells me to, but what God tells me to. A lot of people have breathed, breathed their breath into me. A bit like this balloon that has lots and lots of breath into it. So how can I make myself a child that God will be proud of by allowing God to start to breathe into me? And maybe his breath should be more than the breath of others and the media and the culture. As I face this world, that's going to convince me. Your truth, stupid, stupid. But I can stand up and say, no, my truth is but the only truth because my truth comes from the one who created everything that has all the wisdom, all the power, and all the might because he's the only holy, living God, and he I will follow, believe, and trust with what truth, truth is. Amen.